He would look around, he would know when to go out, when not to go out, he would study the environment. And when he was trapping, this is the one that I remember the most were the trapping days because he would go out and he would know what was happening on the land because of the animals. If he didn't have enough uh, animals in his trap that morning, he would know something was wrong. He would know that uh, maybe he, didn't need, he shouldn't be there in that area because something was happening. Maybe there weren't enough animals in that area. They were being trapped out. Or they were sickness. And that was the thing that concerned him most, was sickness of the animals. And so his knowledge of the land was, was very, um, it was complete. It was, only, it was not only about getting the animals, it was knowing where they were, it was knowing the health of those animals, because our livelihood depended on that knowledge. And so my, my mother, on the other hand, would, uh, when we were going out on the trap line, she would make sure that we would have enough food for the winter. She would remember last time we had 10 sacks of flour, maybe this year we need 20. So things like that, and clothing for the, uh, for the children, she would always have those all hung up and ready for our, when we were going to start moving into the territory of the trapping area. So I don't know when research from our knowledge changed. It seems to me that we've gone from knowledge of our environment and our land and how we were healthy and what we needed to be healthy changed over the years. I think when the colonization became our, our, um, our drive in our communities, we stopped looking at the land, we stopped looking at our environment, we stopped knowing what it is that we're supposed to be doing in order to be healthy. And we started instead looking at numbers. Uh, we started instead looking at data that we really didn't know very much about because how we related to those numbers and those figures, our people don't know how to do that. Many, like, because I live on my reserve at the Pasqua Cree Nation, I know that we don't know when somebody's in our community doing, gathering data for some kind of information. Sometimes there might be three or four different groups that are in there, and they're, they're, the three or four groups are not always compatible to one another. They are in the end, but not as they're moving along through that research. So I think for me, this is a really good research project for somebody to take on. When did we move from knowing who we were on the land and our environment to becoming statistics and figures and numbers on paper that we then had to transfer onto another piece of paper and then onto somewhere else until we actually became the people? the things that we need uh, you know, in our communities to be healthy, to be uh, people that we want to be in, in everyday living. Okay. Thank you, Doris. Um, so within our region, we've always tried to do things around being able to tell that story about who we are. And fortunately, right now, um, there's huge gaps in databases. There's huge gaps in data sets where we're unidentified within those data sources. So it becomes next to impossible to actually tell our story, tell our story of who we are in terms of what, our, what brings us strength, what brings us strength from the connections to our lands and waters. Um, and fortunately, a lot of the data that is out there is very, deficit focused, it's very um, focused on disease and illness. But for us as Anishinaab Bay people, as Nehiyawak people, as the Dene people, we have, um, Creator has given us everything to make us strong, to make us well. 
we just need to be able to draw those strengths out to be able to gather our own information, which is actually relevant to us, not necessarily relevant to the funder, not necessarily relevant to the partners or researchers. RHS has been um, instrumental in creating that, that pathway to, for us to be able to tell our own story. Um, but I think we're at a time now, 20 years later, since the um, inception of RHS, we need to take it a step further. We need to begin to start creating our own stories within that data set and to really not being afraid to um, revamp that survey so that it'll actually identify what our needs and priorities are. Because right now, a lot of the questions, although it is one of the strongest data sets out there for our people, it's also really measuring the assimilation of First Nations within the overall Canadian population. And I don't think that was ever the vision for, of our ancestors. They didn't want that assimilation of our people. They really um, pushed against that. So being able to, one, define our own nation-based indicators of well-being, define our own data sets, being able to draw our stories out from existing data sets and to be able to push back is really, um, would be a way to honor, honor our ancestors and those who have gone, before, gone on before us and to be able to pr prepare for those children who are coming after us. Some of the ways within our region that we're actually doing this is creating our own research data centers to be able to identify First Nations within data sets, but identify them in a way that's um, respectful of First Nations through free prior informed consent, um, through the principles of OCAP and the First Nations um, ethical standards. Um, and to continue to work towards repatriating existing data sets because oftentimes as we've, we've heard through in the past, like often our data sets um, are housed outside of our communities where we don't have access. And that's why um, OCAP has been so strong and has been such a pillar of self-determination in the area of research. And like um, other, other regions, creating our own surveillance systems to be able to continue to draw out those stories in such a way that highlights what's actually working in their communities because our communities are beautiful. <laughs> our communities um, in terms of the families that we come from and oftentimes that's not what you hear in reports, that's not what you hear in media. Um, so one of the ways that we're um, creating that infrastructure to build those surveillance systems within our communities and those data centers is when through the support of chiefs and assembly we have multiple resolutions we have three of them so far that supports the creation of that pathway and it didn't just happen overnight it took some time to have those conversations to build those relationships let's give it back to doris to speak a bit yeah Okay, the uh, Health uh, Information Research Committee uh, is mandated by the Chiefs and Assembly of the, um, uh, in Manitoba. Uh, so they oversee regional health surveys and they also review the research proposals. So we're a committee from uh, different uh, communities. Do we have a picture? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, there, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> So there's uh, myself and there's Rennie Linklater from Opipi Na Piwin. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's Cree, but I, when I see Cree written, I, I'm not very good at uh, transcribing it in my head. And then there's Gloria Rack from uh, Dakota, Dakota Ojibwe uh, Tribal Council. There's Sarah. Samuel from Northlands, uh, the Denny Nation, uh, Alvin Flat from St. Teresa Point, and Guy Goslin from Rusa River, Patricia Dorian from Swamp Cree Tribal Council, which is in the area that I live, 
and Vanessa Tate, uh, a community economic development consultant. Where is she from? Um, Oh, same as yeah, the, uh, same uh, okay, that's um, the, um, hmm. sorry. Um, She's also what? Vanessa? Are you talking about yeah. yeah uh, okay. Uh, Haley Spence LeMay from Lake St. Martin, who is our youth rep. Is she with the one? Is she in here? Yeah, she's oh, she's not in the picture. But we have a youth rep, which is really a, a bonus for us because she is the one that's knowledgeable about the youth, and she's uh, she's very valuable in our uh, in our committee. So those of you that don't have youth reps in your committees, that's a really important uh, component to add. So some of the ways that we're changing the way research is done in, within our region is to develop our own nation-based um, indicators of well-being. We've done a bit of that development at the regional level. Um, we're continuing to do some work um, to describe the look like or how they're similar or where, the, where there's differences. We're doing work around a research project called Cultural Continuity, which actually identifies what those protective factors are for to act as um, a hedge against chronic diseases, um, um, su use suicide prevention. Um, we're also doing work in terms of telling our own stories through um, interviewing TB sur survivors, um, which is a very similar story to the Indian residential schools. Um, we also have a Partners for Engagement Knowledge Exchange project. Um, we have Wendy McDab, who's the lead coordinator in that project. Um, we also have a project called the Indigenous Doula Initiative where we're working with families to bring, um, in tr to begin training Indigenous doulas within our communities. And we're just successful in a re recent re research application um, to bring birthing back to our communities. Because oftentimes, like a lot of these calls, they're really um, focused on chronic diseases. And it's like, how do you see yourself within those calls when you know very well like what is going to address diabetes in our communities, what is going to address um, a lot of the illnesses these calls are around um, in terms of flipping that and focusing on what's going to bring us wellness, what's going to bring, um, how are we going to address our high rates of children in care. Within Manitoba, we're ground zero for ch children apprehensions. So one of the things that um, we're doing is to bring birthing back to our communities, bring our children home, start creating that support system to um, be healthy families again and to bring, um, to reconnect with the land and reconnect to our cultures and our songs and our ceremonies because a lot, there's so much investment into Aboriginal health research, but a lot of that investment is based on reducing disease, reducing illness, but they're completely missing the the underlying factor of what is wellness to the First Nations people of Turtle Island in terms of our connections to our lands and waters and our language and our culture. So one of the um, additional things that we're doing, similar to Ontario, similar to Alberta, um, is linking data sets to be able to tell our stories. Um, because we know our communities are tired. We've heard you time and time again. And in terms of asking the same questions over and over again, we want to make better use of existing data, set, data sets out there. So right now we're currently um, working on data sharing agreements which have recently been signed. This isn't the first time that we're actually linking the Indian Status Registry to administrative data sets. We're actually, this, this is the second time that we're actually doing it.
but this time we're, at, we're doing it with data sharing agreements. We're do, doing that. There was no lawyers back in 2002 when we were negotiating this. That is where the biggest um, holdup was currently in terms of the timeline that we envisioned. We actually envisioned these um, reports being rolled out much sooner, but because of the involvement with um, lawyers going back and forth, not necessarily our partnerships between one another, between different, um, with Manitoba Center for Health Policy or Manitoba Health, it was really um, the understanding of lawyers or their lack of understanding when it came to OCAP and what that actually meant and why that was such an important piece within our data sharing agreements. So we're getting closer. Um, we're getting closer to um, sharing information with them. Um, it's not only our partners who will be doing that at analysis for us. We're going to be sending one of our, um, our own stats analysts to, to do that analysis. So it's not just them handling our data. We're, we're sharing it based on data sharing agreements, and we're actually building that infrastructure on site to be able to continue to do that and create that surveillance system. Um, and then Venketa spearheaded um, this initiative. Thanks. <coughs> so, telling our own stories through data. So I'll be talking about data, but without any quantitative thing involved in it, without any percentages or without any statistics. So this own initiative by us is introduced into the communities that have participated in survey projects such as RHS, RES, and any other regional projects that uh, Finism has introduced on a regional level. Um, when I say data in the communities, it's all about information. So uh, this event is all about uh, gathering information on, on the communities uh, regarding the perspective of data and what does data actually mean to the communities and how did the communities use the data in the past to bring about a positive change within their community when it comes to policies or bringing about any changes within their community. <coughs> so, we also, apart from that, we also talk about uh, the survey processes within the communities. So some of our communities are very successful in reaching their uh, sample targets and some of the communities are not very successful in reaching those targets. So it's very important to know about the gaps, the, the problems, the weaknesses that the community has in order to reach those targets so that we can work on those and make them better. And it is also very important to know about the success stories in the communities that have been very successful in, in collecting, the uh, collecting the data so that we can build on those strengths and we can use these strategies in other communities to boost up the data collection process when it comes to the future surveys, for example, leading into FN-led and RHS-4 or any other regional surveys. And we, are, we can also talk about the specific community requirements for survey processes because each community is different and they have specific requirements how, on how to deploy the survey uh, in the future. So we can gather the information about the specific community requirements when it comes to uh, deploying the sur future surveys. And we can, all the information we gather can also be used to train the communities in the future. Also, we can use that information to train ourselves within Nanada Vigamig to improve the survey processes in the future. So the, the process starts with, um, oh, sorry. The process, uh, the main important thing is to detail the community, the leadership, the chief and council about the event that we are going to organize. And we don't do it by making phone calls or teleconferences or talking through emails, but we actually make an initial visit to the community to detail the, pro to detail the event to the, to the leadership, to the health director. And because we are organizing the event in the community, it's their event. So we take recommendations, we, we take suggestions from the community about how to organize this event. So, and we clarify them with, with, uh, with the answers to the questions if they have anything. And we also get a verbal or written consent from the leadership so that we can actually go into the community and organize this event. And the, at the end of, uh, when we come back and we, 
we asked the community to um, select some of the participants who have used the data directly or indirectly and put them uh, and brought about some changes in the community in a positive way. So once this event is done, we, uh, we also publish an article about the data stories from the community with community's consent. And as a part of this project, we also intend to uh, take some videos about the leadership speaking about OCAP, RHS, RES, and other research projects and their importance. And we are planning to include these videos um, in the training purposes for the future projects, so, such as FN-LED and RHS4. The main purpose of this is the data collectors who come for training will be listening to the importance of OCAP and RHS directly from the leadership, which, which makes them more motivated to reach their goals and reach their sam sample targets. So closing, uh, we, al we already seen in the beginning that research is a kind of relationship and it takes some time to build. So events like this are which make us more close to the communities and opens a pathway to you know, build the relationship to make the research more strong and powerful. And, uh, and it also gives us the opportunity to empower the communities with data and its uses. Because we also gather the information about additional requirements that the, that the community needs in, uh, in order to use the data more effectively. And communities already have this capacity and they just need some part of training to, you know, to make more use of the resources they have. So events like this, like, provide that opportunity for, for, uh, for a regional organization like us to provide that extra support that they need to make the best use of the data they have. So that's, <laughs> that's our research staff. And yeah, that's our research staff led by Kathy Kinev, Leona Starr, and all our colleagues. And that's it. That's our contact information. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? <laughs> so thank you once again to, I'm going to make sure I get these names right, Venkata, Leona and Doris, thank you very much. Our next presentation uh, comes from the Northwestern Yukon First Nations, Our Health, Our Way. And I'd like to invite Christine Genier up here. Christine Genier? Genier was born and raised in Whitehorse. She is a 15-year veteran of the broad, uh, broadcast radio, a writer, a researcher, and an orator. She uses her skill set in these fields to speak about the strength and beauty of her people, the social imbalance affecting, affecting the First Nations of this country in response to colonial structure and everything in between. Most recently, she has been channeling this through research and writing with the Yukon Regional Health Survey 3. Please welcome Christine. Shroni then, Wanik. Shanklen i Renaye. Christine Genye Yanye. My name is Christine Genye. My name is Shanklen. I am of French and Southern Toshone ancestry from the Taiwan Kwechan Council in Whitehorse, Yukon. I am a Wolf Clan member in the uh, traditional way that we introduce ourselves. I will tell you, my mother's name is Shirley Adamson, Jura. She is a Tagish Nation elder from the Yukon. My father was Leo Genier. He was a Frenchman from Sturgeon Falls here in Ontario. And his family came here from France. My grandfather was John Adamson, a coastal Clinket man from Douglas Bay, Alaska. My grandmother was Irene Adamson from the Tanquachan. 
My grandparents from my father's side were Marguerite and Telespar Genier. I was taught to introduce myself like that so that when I speak, people know who gave me permission to speak and where I claim that permission. I would like to say thank you to uh, my elders, any elders, anybody who's taught me. Thank you, Shwani Than. I would like to say thank you to the Algonquin people for hosting us. I would like to say thank you to the FNIGC, to our uh, dissemination uh, approval committee, and I would like to acknowledge that the deputy chief of my First Nation, the Tan Kwachan Council, is here as well, Michelle Tellup. So we're going to do something a little different. I am not a data analyst. I have very little knowledge of statistics really at all. So why am I up here and why am I the last person speaking today? <laughs> well, I'm a storyteller. I've got blackmail. No, I'm joking. Okay. I am a storyteller. I, am, I don't know stats and I don't have a strong relationship with numbers, but I know words. I know words in three languages. And I know my people and I love my people. And uh, our people, uh, anything you see north of the 60th parallel in Canada doesn't really get spoken about a lot. Um, you would think that Canada is missing just its whole top half sometimes when you see reports of statistics and um, any, any stories about the country being reported in the major newspapers. And uh, maybe about 15 years ago, Helen, is that about right? The, the Yukon said, um, what about us? When it came to uh, the FNIGC and uh, the principles of OCAP being spoken about and being used, uh, to which the FNIGC said, well, come on down. <laughs> so um, our population, our numbers aren't, aren't the same as, as the rest of Canada and the Yukon alone, uh, uh, without even separating the Indigenous people from the settler uh, uh, descendants, we cap out at 30,000 for the whole territory. That's like, I think maybe the blocks surrounding us probably hold that population. So when we talk about numbers and uh, when we talk about our health, we're talking about uh, smaller numbers and I think things get approached just a little bit differently and our stories are approached a little bit differently. Sometimes uh, you're looking at maybe three or four people responding in, in, in certain ways to certain questions rather than several hundred. I think that probably changes things up a bit, not knowing um, numbers or statistics. I'm, Got to leave that up to you guys. You guys know them better than I do. I do know that a lot of what happens is that we end up being grouped. I think we all know, uh, no matter where we're from, what it's like. We are Yukon First Nations people, but we are more than Yukon First Nations people. We are the Vantat Gwich'in. We are the Trondek Gwich'in. We are Nacho Nayak Dun. We are uh, Klawani. We are Little Sam and Carmax. We are Champagne and Ajak First Nations. We are the Ta and Kwachan. We are the Kwanlin Dun, the Teslin Klingit, the Kaska Dene. We are diverse. Uh, we have eight uh, separate language groups, uh, two uh, base a language, uh, Athabascan and uh, Klingit. And we have a language barrier. We have a language barrier that I believe, and, uh, and I don't think I'm alone on this. If you know a poet, uh, a slam poet, an academic named uh, Rebecca Thomas, who's a Mi'kmaq from Nova Scotia, speaks about two-eyed seeing and speaks about it very well. And it's when I started learning to speak Southern Toshone uh, from my mom, my mom, who's uh, formative years were still very traditional. What we say is traditional now, but it was just life. And now we use the word traditional to describe it until they had to send her in to go to school. 
And um, because of the nature of um, enfranchisement, because of the racist policies of the Indian Act, my mother was what was called uh, an Indian of white status. And she went to public school. When uh, she grew up, she became a negotiator and uh, helped to negotiate the self-government land claims in the Yukon. It took a lot of her time and it took a lot of my childhood. So now at the ripe old age of 42 years old, I'm now learning how to speak Southern Toshone. What I'm learning in speaking Southern Toshone and learning Southern Toshone is that it's not a language difference like English and French is. When I say this is a piece of paper and I can translate that into French, c'est un papier, c'est un morceau de papier, right? Very direct translation. We don't do that with indigenous languages. It doesn't translate the same way, but we want it to. It's our natural inclination, we want it to. What you have to do is you have to learn the language and then learn what we are saying. We can say, I can tell you how to greet someone and ask them how they are doing, dun cha. Or if I'm speaking to all of you, I'm gonna say dun cha. Or if I'm speaking to the deputy chief or my elder, I'm gonna say dun cha because I wanna show respect. But that doesn't mean how are you. The sentiment is the same. So you have to learn the language. You have to learn that language to find out what we're talking about. When we speak about data and when we speak about where we're at, first, okay, you know what? I really need to say thank you. Thank you to the group who was up before me for saying what they did about measuring the assimilation of Indigenous people. I've been wanting to say that. I've been wanting to find a good way to say that. And they just said it. And thank you because it needed to be said. How many Indigenous people in here have some degree of academic education? How many non-Indigenous people in here have learnt from listening for years and years and years to the same stories from Indigenous elders and they can feel confident telling that story with all its detail. We have learnt the ways of the European colonizers and settlers. We invite you now to learn ours. We are in an evidence-based society, the FNIGC and, well, look at that good looking person, the FNIGC <laughs> Um, is working towards us retaining our information, we, uh, keeping control, access, possession. What my concern becomes is the balance of the oral tradition and the written word. We have an anthropologist uh, at home, or who used to live with us, a uh, non-Indigenous anthropologist who, who did do a lot of work recording stories of uh, the Indigenous elders back in the early 1980s. And what she had found was that, um, just, if you can start that over, I'm just gonna keep clicking through. And um, what she had found was, uh, she had found more questions than answers. That's a little of what I'm working on, writing, uh, writing the report for the Regional Health Survey. Uh, I've been asked to write it in an Indigenous way. I um, am doing that. I'm new to maybe this approach uh, with this kind of work. I'm more of a, an angry post-colonial rage poet. <laughs> and... Uh, so, you know what? Good on them for hiring me. <laughs> I think that is definitely an attempt at reconciliation. Um, Julie Cruikshank is the name of the anthropologist. She, she recorded these stories, and to her great credit, she had said, you know, 
this is a, an academic, this is a person who's, who's been told and who, who, who knows that writing this stuff down preserves it, keeps it forever, legitimizes it, but when she was listening to the stories being told, she started, she could see, and she compared it to the petrification of a forest, a petrified forest. It's got the same components as the trees that used to be there, but those trees aren't trees anymore. They have become stone. The oral traditions, when you write them down, they're still the same story, but they've lost something. So I do, I understand the need to move toward an academic way of gathering our data, of gathering our research, of gathering our information. What I hope is that we don't forget the importance of oral tradition, the importance of keeping this alive and recognizing not, not just, oh yeah, okay, okay. You know, we gotta, we gotta give it that nod. Now, I hear that a lot. You'd be, you'd be surprised. I, I st and I, I imagine a lot of you do too. Okay, oh yeah, don't forget we gotta do this. Kind of that eye roll in the voice. Because without, without that, uh, without that acknowledgement, without acknowledging the absolute abject importance of how we used to keep our information, we're still, we're still remitting information to our foster parent. We are lawyers, we are professors, we are radio broadcasters, we are politicians, we are um, academics now. We know, we know the importance of educating ourselves in the way of the governing people of this country. I do tend to sometimes go off track if a lot of things have been said already or if I get really passionate about a message. So if you will bear with me, that was my message about the language barrier. Indigenous people have something to say. We are not a homogenized group within the country. We are separate. When I was going to school in, uh, and yes, I am academic. <laughs> I do have a, an academic history, only I have a very poor uh, attention span in some ways. I have a diploma from the Centre for Indigenous Theatre in Toronto. I have a diploma in liberal arts from Yukon College. I have a certificate in women and gender studies. I have education that if I put it together, I would have a degree, but none of it seems to match up. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. I would like to, uh, before I run out of uh, time completely, because I understand I am the last person uh, today, and, um, oh, we've got one more. Well, then I don't want to push into their time and be the last person of today. Because, uh, because we don't know too much about the Yukon uh, often, because we don't have a whole lot of people pushing that information out, I'm now going to give you a brief history of my territory. In uh, 1898, you may have heard they found gold in our territory. And then a lot of people, I mean a lot of people decided to hop on a boat and climb a mountain and climb back down that mountain. I don't know why, I thought maybe I would have taken a river route, but uh, they, climbed, they climbed the Chilkoot, they landed in Skagway, climbed the Chilkoot. A couple of them came through Edmonton, and as such, now Edmonton has Klondike days. Makes sense to them. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the Calgary, Calgary has the Stampeders, which is, which is great. And, um, uh, and that is all to get to the Yukon to get gold. So um, suddenly, what is now known as Dawson City was just filled with miners um, and uh, with the miners brought the people who were after the real money, the people who wanted to build the stores, 
who wanted to sell liquor, who wanted to make the money off of the people looking for the mother load. And those are the people that uh, began building what is modern day Yukon Territory on Trondek Huichen uh, Territory and expanded throughout the rest of the Yukon. That was a huge influx there at the end of the uh, 19th century and um, the ones who didn't strike it rich went home or stuck around, probably met someone. That's how a lot of people end up in the Yukon. It's true. And uh, it's how my dad ended up there. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but a lot left because it is. It's, there, there was uh, nothing up there at the time if, if you went up looking for gold um, and, and found nothing but your hopes and dreams dashed. Gold, and again, this, is, uh, this goes to show what we, uh, what we accept as history and written history. Written history says that George Carmax discovered gold in the Yukon. His brother-in-law, Keish, was just happened to be hanging around with him, maybe. But he, uh, he discovered that there was gold here. He was hanging out with George Carmack, uh, his brother-in-law. And, and now maybe some thought that uh, his wife, Kate, was the one who maybe discovered the gold. So we're seeing a little, a few things here where what happens when written history is preferred over the oral tradition. Indigenous people couldn't uh, stake a claim. That's how fast that happened. Indigenous people could not stake a gold claim. So uh, history dictated for a long time. I love the sign, sorry. This is in, this is in Burwash. This is Southern Toshone. These are the road signs that they have in one of our communities. Uh, and we do have them in several uh, communities, the road signs uh, in, in the languages. Um, so that was the start of it for us. Now we celebrate rendezvous every February. Some of us stay home for that week. It calmed down for a little bit. Uh, Dawson City ceased to be the capital of the Yukon. The um, people found it warmer, maybe in Whitehorse. We're a little bit closer to the 60th parallel. And, um, and in 19, whew, 1939, a war broke out in a very, very different part of the world, a war that had nothing to do with us until they found that they had to build a highway to get to Alaska, they being the United States Armed Forces. That brought in our second huge uh, population boom of non-Indigenous people. It brought also disease. So if we are talking about health, that was, um, that was a big factor. That highway coming through was a huge factor. Another thing we saw happening were indigenous men who were not part of the conscription signing up to fight for a country that they would soon find would not fight for them upon their return. I find a, I find a beauty in a, in, in, a, in a friendship I've recently made with a woman from the Netherlands. Because my grandfather was in the Netherlands in the 1940s, gave her people a hand, and now she is here giving my people a hand. And there's just something really beautiful I find about that. So I just wanted to acknowledge Helen, who is here with me today as well. In 1952, uh, the government found that there was a bunch of indigenous people just hanging around. They were like, dudes, what's up? And they gathered them all up and they said, you are now the White Horse Indian Band. Because it just, they weren't hanging around White Horse. And, um, and they said, no, we're not. We are the Kwanlin Dunn. And then some of them because we're just never satisfied, and my grandmother was one of them, said, well, some of us aren't even that. Some of us know where we came from. We are the Tan, 
Well, at that time, they said, we are the Ta'an Dun. We later became the Ta'an Kwachan. And uh, if you're from outside of the Yukon, you may recognize the area. That's from uh, Lake Labarge, from a famous poem, The Cremation of Sam McGee. A couple of people know it. It was on the marge, uh, the bar the march of Lake LaBarge that I created, Sam McGee, that is the lake, and that is where my people are from. That wouldn't happen for, for, for several, several more years. Um, we are very different in some senses from uh, what happened government-wise, what happened relationship-wise with, uh, with the government of Canada. We were the first people to have nation-to-nation -nation negotiations that started with Chief Isaac, who was the chief of the Trondek Wichin people when uh, people first came looking for gold. Uh, the second person, there is a poster that comes through here. I'm just doing this as a slideshow, show, slideshow so nothing I say is actually attached uh, to most of this, but um, uh, Chief Jim Boss told uh, in 1902, and, uh, and his sister, Jean Day, saw that um, the people weren't going to leave. These people who came in, they, they weren't going to go anywhere. And he said, tell the king, tell the king, I want, we want something because for our people, for our game and our land. That was... Um, nation-to-nation -nation negotiations starting there because a uh, funny little thing forgot to happen in the Yukon. Treaties weren't signed. I think that <laughs> they got comfortable in, in, um, in some of what they were doing and just maybe forgot to sign treaties. And in 1972, a group of Yukon indigenous people uh, called the Yukon Native Brotherhood and the Yukon Association of Non-Status Indians got together and formed the Council of Yukon Indians. And they put together a document that I can't think of a more apt title. And I wish every government would just title all of their, all of their policies this. Together today for our children tomorrow. And they came here to this city. And they said, we got to talk because we tried starting this conversation, and we did, we tried. We gotta talk, and you gotta account to more than the people you have registered because of some racist policies with the Indian Act. We are also having to take care of our non-status Indians. Those negotiations took over 20 years. They thought it would take six months. My mother was a chief negotiator, and I didn't see her a lot growing up. That's how much it meant. Indigenous people love their babies. I mean, I imagine all people love their babies, but I know it from my Indigenous mother, my Indigenous grandmother. To give up that time teaching your children, that's how important that was. That's the fight they did for our health then. So we don't have a lot of numbers in, in the sense for uh, the Regional Health Survey before 2000 and, I'm gonna get Helen to. Well, we first participated in 2002, 2003. 2002, 2003. Our numbers, our population, um, we don't see, and again, you got to talk to the experts, which are you guys, to, to, to see how data works in that way. We are now uh, self-governing First Nations. We are governments. We talk to each other as governments. I personally can get a little indignant, and maybe I'm not the best person to represent in the sense of when I talk about our governments in the Yukon, it's the territorial government, municipal governments, it's the First Nation governments. We are self-determining. We are self-governing. There he is, Kishwit, Chief Jim Boss. 
we um, are strong, we are here. I have uh, my own personal belief that when we um, live long enough on a territory, any territory, some of our energy stays there and you can still talk to people, I think. Or maybe it's just my crazy way of saying when I got off the plane last night and I could feel who's all hung out here in the last few hundred years, I just wanted to say, hey, John A. McDonald, how do you like us now? <laughs> Thank you for indulging me this afternoon. Shronithan, Shronithi. As someone with a theater background too, I really gotta say thank you to the folks running tech. I think we really have to say thank you. Um, before I do leave for our next presenters though, I would like to invite my colleagues, Helen Stopper, We have uh, some incredible artists in the Yukon. We have some incredible artwork in the Yukon. This is Helen's, Helen and I. <laughs> Helen knows numbers and I know words and together I think we make a pretty good person. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, so we have uh, beautiful artists in the Yukon. It's always so difficult to choose, to choose uh, whose art we would have represent uh, what we want to say when we want to say thank you, when we want to say shronithi, shronithan. This time around we picked a beautiful uh, carver named Lorraine M. Wolf. She is from the Carcross Tagish First Nation in the Yukon. I don't want to, uh, uh, just uh, with the two of us, so I'm actually going to ask Sharon uh, Vitroqua to join us up here as well. And if he is still in the house, I would please uh, ask um, uh, Mr. Dewar to please join us up here. Jonathan. Hmm? Yes. And Barbara. Sorry. You're not allowed to holler at your elders. brought this and would like to present it to yourself and the FNIGC on behalf of the Council of the Yukon First Nations and the people of the Yukon. Thank you much. Oh. So thank you for letting me ramble this afternoon. It was a bit of a ramble. I, um, I, I, I look forward to a future where we can start seeing, now this is a difficult thing for me to say because there are people who I have an incredible, incredible amount of respect for and who've done such incredible work. But I do look forward to the day when our directors of health services, when our directors of children's services, when the directors in charge of the programs in charge of us are Indigenous people, when we're not recording our assimilation. And I hope that happens. Um, hope that happens in my lifetime, and I hope uh, you guys will have me back here one day to talk about it. Shonithan. Thank you, Christine. Um, it wasn't a ramble. It reminds me a lot about uh, my sister when she was in medical school at UBC, and um, she was in a class, and she was—they were teaching them how to question or 
question patients or interview patients. And it was always supposed to be A plus B equals C. What are your symptoms? You know, what do we need to do? And then, and she would start asking the person all these questions. So, are you married? Do you have any kids? She asked them all these questions, and she get all this information. It would be like, it take about three times the amount of time, but then she would get to the point and her professors kept getting mad at her and she's like, well, that's how we do it. Like if you were to sit down across from an, a native patient and say, what hurts? Where does it hurt? Point at it. They'll clam up. So you got to make them comfortable and then you got to get to know them and then suddenly you know all this environmental information about them and you can better treat them. And so, you know, the professors were like looking at her like she had two heads, but I mean, that's how she practices medicine. You can't always go directly as researchers, sometimes you know asking questions directly are hard, right? You got to warm the person up to trust you. And, and uh, so it wasn't a ramble. Out of that is a lot of information. And it reminds me of my time up in, in uh, the Yukon last year when I was working with the National Enquiry as the director of community engagement. And I had to first engage with the, the community up there to start planning some um, hearings. And I got called in by a whole, they were the Yukon women's, just the Yukon women. They were ministers, they were chiefs, they were this. And I got on this call and I was like, oh my goodness. I hit like a brick wall of power. And <laughs> they were awesome. So. I really loved being up there. I felt right at home because I'm used to those brick walls and I got thick skin. In Mohawk culture, you say you have to have skin seven spans thick if you're going to take any kind of position of leadership. So yeah, boy, did I get tested up there. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I would like to invite our next presenter who is, is our last presenter um, on how RHS data is used being by Saskatoon Tribal Council. I'd like to invite Seal Tournier She's from Saskatchewan. She's a Saskatchewan board member for the FNIGC, General Manager of Saskatoon Tri Tribal Council's Health and Family Services, and has worked in the First Nations Health and Social Service Delivery at the community and tribal council level since 1991. She is a passionate advocate for developing and formalizing a First Nations self-government framework within Canada and Saskatchewan. Please welcome Seal. Good afternoon. Not the most envious position here this afternoon, standing between you and your free time, so I'll try and make it quick. <laughs> a lot of people have heard me before. I've been involved in this area for a long time. I'd like to thank the Algonquin people for hosting us here in, in the territory. Of course, uh, Elder Claudette for her opening prayer, although I wasn't here um, when it was said. Um, I'm hoping that she's taken her vast amount of experience in helping Air Canada to fix their problems <laughs> for anybody who traveled yesterday. Today it was quite the challenge. Um, I want to thank everybody who's been involved with RHS and data collection from time immemorial. Everybody contributes, and we've heard that here, you know, during today, and, and it'll continue tomorrow. Everybody makes a huge contribution, and we all learn from each other. And and. I certainly learn something new every time I attend our, our release conferences and talk to people, and so I encourage that kind of networking to go on as much as possible. Um, as was indicated, I go back a long ways in First Nations Health. And back in 1991, the tribe, my tribal council came and said, I think you should come and work for us. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? And they said, well, well they've got this thing called health transfer. And I says, okay, so what do you want me to do? And they says, well, there's also this whole other stuff around child welfare in Saskatchewan. The moratorium's been lifted. I says, what do you want me to do? And so they sent me a 15-page job description. And I laughed. I phoned it back. I says, what do you want me to do? <laughs> so that's kind of how I came about uh, this file as well. I just finished doing the work in Saskatchewan. My assigned file was daycare or early childhood. And we just finished the Halifax formula. And uh, the person who was leading the file in Saskatchewan had just left. So it just became a natural transition that I got the RHS file, as it was called back then. I wasn't very enthusiastic, but I certainly changed my mind very short, very soon after that. So in Saskatchewan, um, or in Saskatoon Tribal Council, I guess I'm talking from Saskatoon Tribal Council, that's what I was asked to do today. So I work for the Saskatoon Tribal Council, and I did negotiate health transfer, and I did um, integrate health transfer with child welfare. Hence our corporate entity, uh, the service delivery arm inside of our Tribal Council being STC, Saskatoon Tribal Council, Health and Family Services, Inc. So we're an integrated model that was very clear right from the beginning. Um, and 
RHS played a large part in sort of those developments and those continuations. So we'll go to the very first, whoops, where do I point this? There we go. Very first survey of 1995, 1997. I think we did data collection and we had all these really great experts advising us. We called them their um, principal investigators group. Um, and so they were our, our co principal investigators group. That's what they were our sea pigs. I remember anybody who was back in with us in those days. And I think uh, Manitoba, John O'Neill is still working with them. He was one of our originals. So Saskatoon Tribal Council back then was part of the national survey, obviously, and we did a 10% sample. I was so excited. We worked so hard. We talked about all these wonderful things we were doing in terms of gathering data and what that would provide for, for our First Nations in terms of being able to analyze that. Because don't forget, I've already completed health transfer now, so we're kind of going through this process. We're going to have to do evaluations, etc. So we did our 10% sample, and I plan to utilize that sample for health transfer evaluation. I want to know our health status. You can't imagine the aspirations I had for a 10% sample in a population that was about 10,000 people on reserve. So needless to say, when I got all my wonderful data rolled up just like we'd promised in that first go around and started to look at everything, I'm going, I have to suppress the cell. This cell has to be suppressed. I can't even look at that because it's going to be identifiable by community. So I learned a really hard lesson very early on. On a 10% sample in a small population doesn't give us a lot. So um, we participated through our data in the, uh, regional processes and in national projects, but that's as about as far as we got for that very first go around. So that was my experience and our experience at the Tribal Council. And you think about that now and going like, how many of us would go into the field now and not realize a 10% sample isn't going to do a whole heck of a lot for us? But back then, like I said, I was really excited about this 10% sample. So we went on and we started the uh, second RHS, uh, and I mean, it's, this is interesting because the first one was longitudinal and we've gone four waves, but they, we only count three. I mean, I'm not too sure. Anyways, I know we've gone out in the field four times to do data collection. The second time was in 2002, 2003, and I wasn't going to be making the same mistakes twice, I'll tell you. So STC was the first tribal council to go out for a complete 100% survey sample. Every man, woman, and child was interviewed. Um, I think we had a 94% response rate. It was phenomenal. I mean, we've got really rich data that we continue to, to use in terms of baselining, progress, and all those kinds of things uh, within it. Um, we also ended up uh, providing a comprehensive picture now on the health status of, of our communities. Um, we had well, health status, we had wellness, resiliency, and we also did specific subjects of interest to STC members. And then, of course, there was also areas of real great concern at that time. Um, we used... Um, we used the data to complete our health transfer evaluation, uh, which was very valuable. We utilized RHS2 um, to commission our original Zucker report. We call them Zucker 1 and Zucker 2. But what, what Richard Zucker, he's a health economist based actually here in Ottawa, uh, and what he did was he looked at not just what the funding was that we were receiving through health transfer, but also about the pressures and workloads that contributed to the, the, the growing gap, if you want, in service delivery in our communities. The final piece that he analyzed, where he says, okay, so if this is the workload now and these are the, these are the gaps that we project, what's going on in the government side? So how is government funding itself in comparison to that? And what we found was that, of course, there was huge disparities. Um, so that was the first time, and of course, we used that along with the RHS data to build evidence to, do, to attempt to do renewals and renegotiations. Um, but it still was a basis of, a, of the first 10 years of transfer, at least for the Saskatoon Tribal Council, and we were one of the, one of the first four to transfer in Saskatchewan. So it continues to, to uh, do its work in that way as a, as a baseline. Um, 
we utilized we utilized the RHS as well in our first in our member First Nations um, to do health budgets, right? Uh, identify community pri priorities, and we also were combining data sets back at that time at the community level to get a more comprehensive picture of what was going on in the community. So leadership had a better idea. So we were producing reports and working with staff to analyze data to bring data in from other departments and and working collaboratively that way. So we basically set a baseline for sort of some capacity development and ongoing questions of inquiry, if you, if for, for lack of a better word. Um, so we moved on. So after that, we kept on, we kept on trucking. We went to RHS 2008-10, and again we did our data collection at census level. But this this time round, um, we'd also renewed what we called in Saskatchewan the uh, Saskatchewan First Nations Urban Services Protocol Agreement. And what it was was the independent bands and tribal councils and all the member First Nations, all, all the First Nations of Saskatchewan, got together and decided that we had to create efficiencies and be more effective in service del delivery if we were going to be able to serve our people well. And we knew that we couldn't serve our people in Regina, you know, North Battleford, Yorkton, uh, Meadow Lake, Prince Albert, et cetera. And people, the, the Tribal Council of those areas knew the same thing for, for their own people in Saskatoon. So what ended up happening is that the protocol basically sort of established the responsibility for the Tribal Councils in those areas um, under a reciprocal basis. So if our members are living in Prince Albert Grand Council, AGC is responsible for treating them the same way as if they were their own band members and we're responsible for treating Prince Albert Grand Council band members as if they're our own and vice versa all through the whole system and it's all signed off. So what we needed to do at that time was because of our additional responsibility and I think the census at that time had said that there was 20, 22 or 27,000 First Nations people living in the city of Saskatoon. So our former tribal chief used to make mention that basically it was probably one of the largest First Nations bands in, in Saskatchewan were, you know, was actually you know, population-wise living in, in, within the boundaries of that urban centre. Um, so we added a small test uh, sample in our urban population so that we ended up with the seven individual members, the urban session, uh, se section, and then all of us together, or the seven and then the one. But nine different status health status reports were completed from that, that go-round. We also at that time started um, a quality of life um, strategic plan. So we put that in place that uh, projected into the future to 2020. And we're basically now, of course, in the process of not only just reanalyzing our successes um, and our, our challenges, but also um, renewing it for the next 20 years. Um, inside of that plan, we identified accreditation or ISO certification as a pathway to excellence in service delivery. We again needed to talk about the quality of service that was being provided to, to our members. And, that's the whole reason to have data as far as our tribal council's concerned. If you can't improve what's going on, um, or at least use it as a pathway, then then it's it's not really useful. We used RHS uh, to establish quality improvement targets and plans, and um, we also did a lot of other work. We also went back and completed Zucker 2. Uh, the differential identified in Zucker 2 was astronomical. It basically, uh, it, it was year over year, $2 million differential between how we were funding how we were funded by the government with workload and and uh, market pressures in comparison to what they were doing. And we're not a very large, I mean, seven communities is our tribal council and the urban center. Um, and of course, that's all different funding. It's not on reserve funding. So two million year over year is pretty astronomical when you look at the differential. And this is what the government funded themselves. So it's not something that's unrealistic. Um, so anyways, and of course we've presented that to government on a number of occasions which, um, and in different scenarios which uh, has not necessarily gotten the response that we were hoping for. Um, we also use the data to co uh, to compile, in line with this, um, a pilot project for, mature, for a mature health organization. By by the time that we were rolling here, we were almost, you know, through our primer for accreditation. Um, we were using indicators as measures. We were fighting the government on both Indian Affairs side and on Health Canada side about outputs. There was no point in measuring outputs. I didn't care how many people came to the workshop. I wanted to know that people left the workshop and changed their behavior. 
behavior. So it was about the indicators and the outcomes, not the outputs. And so we were pushing on that from about 2008. And that was a direct result of the fact that we could baseline against multiple years and trend it over time to see if there was differences being made. Um, we used the RHS data, the small sample size, to match against um, one of the reports that was done in Saskatoon. It was one of the first in Canada. It was a, a Saskatoon health um, by, by um, health disparity by neighborhoods report. So in the city of Saskatoon, we have a large concentration of First Nations population, the six core neighborhoods. And so uh, we had to look at that report because we had basically partnered with the local health authority. And then I was in the position of having to go to our leadership and say, the disparities ranged on the small end at 30% to 3,200% between the people living in that seven, six core neighborhoods and the ones living in the upper middle class or high class, whatever you want to call it, neighborhoods. The biggest disparities were around things for service provision for mental health. If you lived in the six core neighborhoods, you would end up in service after a suicide attempt or a major depression. If you were in First Nations, you would get three days of in-service care. If you came from a Forest Grove or a Briarwood or one of the very big, high-class, you know, high-income areas, your minimum stay was 36 days. So why the difference, right? So they say there's no racism in Saskatchewan. I think our former premier said that, right? There's no racist problem in Saskatchewan. But I mean, so we, we, we looked at all of the data and we had to find where our strengths were. Our immunization rates in community ranged from 95 to 100%. And so we looked at the rates of immunizations and they were worse than third world countries in the inner city of Saskatoon. They were actually under 40%. So he says, hey, look, we know where our families are. We know what they, you know, where to, where to find them. And so we entered into, they gave us money for an, uh, oh, some, some uh, drops into the mail and all that kind of stuff. Anyways, what we did was we just basically hired people that were connected to community who knew where our people were, and then we went and found them, transported them, and immunized babies. We moved um, from 40, less than 40% to just under 80% in 18 months. And if you see the presentations by the local health region, the medical health officer in Saskatoon Health Authority claimed that it was because they sent them letters. Yeah. So again, you know, so doing all the work, and of course we're going to do the work because it is our families, but in the end it's the context and the interpretation. I'm going, and I phoned him and I says, really? It's because you sent letters? It wasn't the fact that when all those letters came back, you gave them to us in the health center downtown and then we went to find them that contributed to the fact that we moved at 18, uh, to under 80%, and he had to concede that probably that had some impact. I thought so too. Um, at the same time, the RHS data at that time had identified, and this was not a number that at that time we would share with anybody, self-identified exposure risk and or diagnosis of HIV in our 16 to 55 population was running about 7%. 0.2%. That was astronomical, and when I went to the medical health officers and Health Canada, they said, oh, your numbers are wrong. You know, it's all self-reported, and you know, we don't really know about the quality of your data collection anyways. So several years later, what happens, but Atakaku First Nation, which is just north and basically integrated with our communities, an independent band, announced that their door-to-door -door testing screening had resulted in Guess what? An 8% HIV infected population in that age group. So again, it was a validation on the, of the fact that we were using our own data, collecting our own data, analyzing that data, and working with our communities. So in the city of Saskatoon, we ended up starting the SHARP program. So it was a harm reduction program, um, and it was based on that identified percentage um, uh, inside of our inside of our communities, we know that our population is very transient. We we surround the city of Saskatoon in the summertime. Everyone goes home in the wintertime. They're pretty much all back in Saskatoon because you can't sort of camp out or just you know hang out um, in 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 the in the country in the wintertime. Not in Saskatchewan, anyways. 
So our harm reduction program, our SHARP program, uh, is basically the largest harm reduction program in Saskatchewan. We exchanged last year 1.52 million needles. Our percentage of ret re return ran from 98 on a month over month basis, 98 to 103 percent. So our folks are not only uh, returning the needles and bringing them back, but they actually stop along the way, pick them up and give them to us and tell us where they found them so that we can pin them on the wall. So our clients are also our partners in a lot of ways and that's how we like to keep it. We we have seen, though, a, a bit of a shift with regards to the kinds of drugs that are being used and injected now. They're not quite as friendly as they used to be, um, but um, at the same time, they still participate actively in their care. Um, we go to uh, sessions and uh, with with the rest of the health region, and we go through 50 active cases every day, uh, every Wednesday, to link to make sure that people continue to be linked to care. Basically, out of those 50. 40 are not actively engaging with that other with the with the predominant system we see them and they engage with us so it's it's vastly much more respected and utilized than any other health system for for people dealing with living positive um, all right last part from the 2000 um, 8 10 uh, RHS is that in that, in that com comparative study, we also noted that 14, less than 14% of families living in that area had a primary care physician. And so what that was doing was putting extraordinary pressure on emergency rooms throughout the city, pr particularly St. Paul's Hospital and City Hospital, for any of you familiar in Saskatoon. So what we ended up doing, and, and a lot of times we were, we'd be catching our parents or advocating and saying, like, why, is, why, why are you bringing your child after school for, you know, an earache or, you know, whatever it was, um, to the emergency room or pulling them out of school and going to the emergency room? And virtually it was because they didn't have access to a family doctor and nobody was accepting new patients. So we ended up in a partnership with the University um, of Saskatchewan, the College of Medicine, School uh, Department of Pediatrics, um, and ourselves and the Greater Catholic School Board. Um, the uptake on the social piece, we had two pediatricians full-time in, in a school environment in an old classroom at the time, and it, the population of the children um, was basically at a point where the school was going to close. And we opened the program in about November. By the following year, the school was on fast track to be built. We'd gone from a, just under 100 students in the school to over 250. The principal went out and said, why are you registering your kids at St. Mary's School? And they said, because you have access to family, well, pediatricians, we had mental health, we had psychiatrists, and all these services that we have in our community were all established and available. We had eyes, ears, everything was being done right at the school. Um, the school now has approximately 500 uh, enrolled children, zero to uh, grade one to six, and uh, they see 4,000 uh, children, or 4,000 families each year. So that's the need that's going on there. So all driven again by the fact that RHS had data involvement with regards to making decisions about where to put our investments. And although we have seen a, a shift at St. Paul's Hospital, we still have some work to do there, but at least it's not children coming in in emergency in the middle of the night for an earache, a toothache, or anything like that. So our, the one that we're talking about now, uh, wave three, RHS four as I call it. Um, again, we're using RHS system-wide to determine levels of federal commitments in health education, nation to nation, et cetera. All the things that, like, that our leadership is talking to government about, we're being asked for data and numbers specific to First Nations and or our tribal council as a whole. And based on the preliminary findings um, and the work that we've been doing in the other projects, we've finalized a mobile Bridge to Care project for chronic disease and HIV, Hep C, STBBIs, and that means that it does will will actually do testing right in community and connect to care back into the into the into the city. Um, we established partnerships to broaden the Because You Matter and Know Your Status campaign against the spread of HIV, Hep C, and other infections. A lot of it driven by the fact of the work that we've been doing based on our RHS evidence. We have MOUs with uh, infectious disease doctors. All of our data comes back to us. When our data doesn't come back to us, we use contracts. I've been burnt using agreements, MOUs, protocols. Now, if you're going to use STC data in a way that we haven't agreed for you to use it, you will pay 
pay damages and we will take you to court. And we've threatened it and we've done it. And so we've settled out, but at least people know that we're serious. If you're going to come and work with us, you will respect what's been going on in terms of OCAP principles because we mean business around it. And like I say, at one point it was our tagline, see you in court. <laughs> Not with our First Nations members, but with others who, who basically would always say, oh, well, I didn't know, and all the rest of it. No, you just didn't take the time to read the contract before you signed it. So anyway, so that's the work that we've been doing. Um, again, all the documents, I you know, just simply took pictures because, of course, to add to the Air Canada tribulations that we had, um, I, that we had yesterday, I also had a computer crash as I was finalizing my presentation for you here today. So these are all out of order, but our health status report 2011 to 2016 um, stats and data about sort of our incidence of you know 367 times higher in terms of suicide ideations by age group um, things that are pretty these ones are total like totals not individual communities diabetes prevalence on that one our quality of life strategic plan initiatives the help whoops the health disparity report that I spoke about, the publication there, and then of course the capacity building that's gone on, developing health and wellness indi indicators, understanding indicators, and I know I've heard a lot of people talk about it, it's not just deficit indicators, but deficit indicators unfortunately is still what continues to drive government, so until we can get that switched around, um, we're still utilizing them in that way unfortunately. Um, you know, we've got the, again, the quality of life initi initiative that talks about uh, what do we want to achieve uh, in the short and long terms. And then our uh, transformation project that went, uh, that's basically a 10 year project, June 2015 to June 30th, 2025. Um, so in the end, I mean, our data has been used in a multiple of ways um, and in multiple different contexts. Um, it's baseline information to um, understand if our investments over time have had a real impact. Um, it's, it's identify areas of concern and priorities. We're able to access outside databases by, um, by linking because we have something to link to. And then, of course, then we snag them with our contracts. So now not only do we have access to the data, but now we have actual ownership and possession as well. Um, we have evidence for programs uh, for either funding or like getting funding or increasing funding. We utilize it to engage First Nations in analysis inquiry in context all right because we can't do the reports without the context from the community so it, it, it also helps with the, um, the capacity uh, development and awareness of the community there's growing interest in surveillance and we're looking at surveillance programs now now to, to basically be able to do that in-house um, we understand that data is power and developing the foundation for capacity is is really another another strength strength of that um, we are able to build partnerships uh, for quality service, OCAP, again, awareness, and engage from a nation-to-nation -nation perspective or nation-to-government perspective, but we are the nation that holds its own data and therefore working from that way. Um, it's been utilized just recently in our tribal council to move from a tribal council to what our leadership has identified through the wish of our communities to move back to our traditional ways of being. And so on January 4th of this year, 2018, our seven leaders and the communities came together in a, pipe, in a pipe ceremony to form the treaty alliance between our seven nations. Um, a very powerful ceremony that basically resets the whole thing about why the tribal councils exist. And um, in our tribal council, it's because it is all family and we are all related, but it's also because there's been a desire and a commonality to the aspirations that they want to achieve. So instead of being a government-made institution of a tribal council, they have now formed the Seven Nations Alliance and yet to be named what we will, what we will move, for, move to in the, in the future. Um, so that was the, the latest uh, utilization of the data um, and analysis that we brought forward. Uh, for our leadership. So other than that, I think I'm probably close to being at my time, so I don't think there'll be any questions. There we go, five, 501. <laughs> so thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Seal. That was, uh, 
you know, I, Saskatoon, I love Saskatchewan and the, all the work that you're doing. It's really interesting. And I know all of you, it's been a long day of, of absorbing a lot of data and information. And I know the way most of your brains work, this is just like awesome. It's not over yet. There is a special event tonight that you cannot pass up. That's happening upstairs at the, on the panorama, in the panorama at the penthouse level. There are hors d'oeuvres being provided, a cash bar, and there is live music. I know Josh Lewis, and he's an awesome guy, and I did not know he sang. All I know, he worked with my son. He goes around to schools, and he's a teacher, so he's also a singer. I, one of those people that you're like, really, you're, you're an artist, and you're a super smart guy, and you're a nice guy? He's like an all-around amazing guy. And Lal Ojig and the Northern Steam will be performing. So, you know, today has been amazing. I know I've take it in a lot. Uh, I'm very humbled by your intelligence and your hard work and someone who comes from a real non-data minded background. Um, you explained it to someone like me and I understood a lot of what was going on. So thank you very much for, for making that accessible to me. And uh, thank you for a great day and being your MC has been a pleasure. I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. I'm going to go home. My three kids are texting me and wondering where I'm at and when's bath time and when I'm putting them to bed. So uh, that's, uh, that's my job. I'm switching hats. Mom hat comes on. I'll see you all bright and early tomorrow morning for breakfast, right? Hot breakfast and uh, another day of uh, incredible information sharing. So have a great evening.